While slavery was abolished in the British Empire in 1833, it was not until 1904 that the heinous practice of blackbirding was brought to an end. Blackbirding is the term used to describe the practice of enslaving and exporting South Pacific Islanders to the cotton and sugar plantations in other colonies. And it is difficult not to draw the conclusion that blackbirding was encouraged to continue in the South Pacific, well beyond the abolition of slavery in the rest of the British Empire, due to Vanuatu's remoteness and isolation from Europe and the New World. In 2021, however, facts do matter. The lives of the people of Vanuatu do matter. And the truth is not so easily suppressed anymore. Having only gained its independence in 1980 from France and Britain, the Republic of Vanuatu is a recently graduated least developed country and small island developing state with a GDP per capita estimated at less than 3,000 US dollars in 2019. This is the 30th lowest GDP per capita in the world, right below Haiti. Vanuatu's major economic drivers are fishing, agriculture, tourism, offshore financial services, and an economic citizenship program. Vanuatu consists of roughly 65 inhabited and 83 in total volcanic and coral islands in a Y-shaped archipelago stretching 1,300 kilometers north to south between Fiji and Eastern Australia in the Southern Pacific. Vanuatu's total land surface is only 4,700 square miles, slightly larger than the Caribbean island of Jamaica. The almost entirely indigenous population of Vanuatu numbers roughly 308,000 persons, which is less than half the population of Luxembourg or slightly larger than Barbados. Because it is located in the middle of the Pacific Ring of Fire, and lies directly in the center of the Pacific Cyclone Belt, Vanuatu is the number one most at-risk country for natural disasters in the world. Vanuatu's tax framework includes a VAT and import tariffs, but no corporate nor personal income tax is applied. Tax administration in Vanuatu is considered to be weak, likely based on the chronic institutional and public administration deficiencies characteristic of extractive colonies, which persist for generations after independence. Importantly, despite its zero corporate tax status, as of 2019, Vanuatu has been classified as partially compliant overall by the OECD, which is the Global Tax Policy Authority and does not appear on Tax Justice Network's Corporate Tax Haven Index. Furthermore, neither the OECD nor Tax Justice Network have advised Vanuatu to implement a corporate tax, nor did they suggest that Vanuatu's existing tax structure was inappropriate or harmful in any way. Beyond the issue of tax, as of June 2018, the world's only recognized global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog, the FATF, lists Vanuatu as no longer subject to the FATF's monitoring process. Furthermore, in March 2021, the UK published its list of high-risk third countries and did not include Vanuatu. So while Vanuatu is not on any global tax or money laundering or terrorist financing authorities lists, of course there is room for improvement. And in this dynamic environment where regulation by definition lags innovation, especially as it relates to financial crime, there will always be room for improvement, not just for Vanuatu, but for every nation on earth. Enter the European Union who has appointed itself the god of taxes and the god of anti-money laundering and counteracting terrorism financing, or AML-CFT. The EU published its first tax blacklist of 17 non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes in December 2017. 
Vanuatu was placed on the EU's tax grey list in January 2018 and blacklisted by the EU in March 2019, where it has remained since. The EU also adopted a modernized regulatory framework to identify high-risk third countries in 2015 and in September 2016, published its first AML CFT blacklist, including Vanuatu, where it remains even today. It is quite the bureaucratic and statistical feat that the EU was able to concoct and execute a methodology for its blacklists so complex, so sophisticated, so precise, and ultimately so effective in achieving their true unstated but obvious intent that it managed to produce not one, but two blacklists where not one single country is predominantly white and where not one single country is a significant ally of powerful, predominantly white countries. Furthermore, the EU's complex methodology for its tax blacklist makes the ultimate omission, actual tax havens. EU members of parliament highlighted the fact that jurisdictions currently on the EU tax haven blacklist account for less than 2% of worldwide tax revenue losses and only 1.1% of global economic activity, while EU countries themselves are responsible for 36% of tax havens and, of course, are never blacklisted. This directly contravenes the EU's own doctrine of proportionality. As we say in the Caribbean, monkeys don't like to see their own tails. By blacklisting small, non-white, non-EU countries which dare to exercise their sovereign right to set their own domestic corporate tax rates too low, the EU effectively destroys the fledgling competition and blacklisting is evidently their weapon of choice to maintain their dominance. The EU is overstepping its bounds by dictating the tax policies, if not the ideologies, of countries beyond its membership. The EU's tax haven blacklist methodology is farcical at best. It is disposable in the first place, deceitfully overcomplicated, ever-changing, not evidence-based, not transparent, and shamefully, absolutely subjective, resulting in a blacklist of countries that is at once completely arbitrary, yet perfectly reveals its true malicious intent. Furthermore, the EU failed to specifically identify the deficiencies in Vanuatu's AML CFT framework or any other criteria explaining why Vanuatu remains blacklisted by the EU. There is no body or international treaty that gives the EU the legal or even moral authority to unilaterally impose separate requirements over and above the OECD and FATF or to impose sanctions of any kind, blacklisting or otherwise, on any EU non-member country. The EU's action should therefore be considered extrajudicial in nature, given that the FATF and the OECD are the internationally recognized authorities on AML, CFT and tax policy respectively, not the EU. And the FATF and OECD are satisfied with Vanuatu's AML, CFT and tax frameworks. The extent of the EU's overreach into Vanuatu's sovereignty and the OECD and FATF's territory, its grossly disproportionate treatment of one of the smallest, poorest and most vulnerable countries on earth, its shamefully discriminatory stance based on size and ethnicity, its weaponization of its selectively applied standards, and ultimately its unapologetic immorality and de facto subjugation of the people of Vanuatu is beyond abhorrent. The consequences of being placed on the EU's blacklists should not be underestimated, as they are of a socio-economic, 
existential magnitude for Vanuatu. Beyond the near irreversible reputational damage caused by blacklisting, banks in Europe and North America are in effect compelled to de-risk banks from Vanuatu and all blacklisted jurisdictions by withdrawing or reducing correspondent banking services and in many cases even physically exiting these jurisdictions. The withdrawal of correspondent banking services from Vanuatu is, in effect, to place a knee on the carotid artery of its economy, with socio-economic consequences that no small, poor and highly vulnerable country can survive, especially in this pandemic. Assuming that the goal of blacklisting is to reduce money laundering, terrorism financing and tax evasion in the first place, Blacklisting, especially in a country where institutions are already weak, where there is a high level of informality in the economy, and where cash usage is high, blacklisting is counterproductive because it leads to de-risking, which drives higher levels of informality and cash usage, even for cross-border transactions. No other form of payment and settlement is more conducive to money laundering and tax evasion than cash-based transactions. So in addition to the damaging effects of blacklisting, reputationally, economically, and ultimately socially, it also increases the risk of money being laundered and taxes being evaded. Furthermore, blacklisted countries are subject to sanctions by the EU. This is precisely what the world's most vulnerable country to natural disasters a recently graduated least developed country and one of the world's poorest countries does not need. In the context of the pandemic, which has thrown Vanuatu into a recession, the EU's behavior is nothing short of brutal. And indeed, the EU's blacklists are a clear manifestation of Europeans' long-standing penchant for domination, exploitation and brutality which evidently continues unabated even today. The EU's policies in this context represent indisputable examples of institutional racism and bullying. Evidently, we, the former European colonies, are being held to a higher standard than our former colonizers by our former colonizers. We are still denied the sovereignty to manage our domestic affairs even in a manner similar to that of our former colonizers. There is no precedent for this in history. In the context of a global pandemic in the first place, and Black Lives Matter more significantly, when it is finally politically incorrect to behave in such a brutal neo-colonial manner, we demand that the EU cease and desist from its economic warfare, dressed up as its totally unjustified blacklisting of Vanuatu.